Welcome everybody to the IMSC Algebraic Combinatorics Seminar. It's a great pleasure today to have uh, Ajmain Yamin from Stony Brook University. He's going to talk about filtering Grassmannian cohomology via k sure function. Ajmain, please. Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Ajmain and uh, our project is called filtering Grassmannian cohomology for via k shear functions. Right. So first, uh, I'll just give an overview of what we'll be covering in this presentation. First, we'll cover some basic notions and these include the ring arc LK, Hilbert series, Q binomial coefficients, and um, second, we'll talk about the reiner todozi conjecture and an implication to, uh, Hoff, uh, to Hoffman's theorem. Actually, we'll talk about Hoffman's theorem after the third section. And in the third section, we will talk about k shear functions and an interpretation of the reiner todozi conjecture. And in the fourth section, we'll talk about a Lagrangian analog of the reiner todozi conjecture. So first of all, uh, what is this ring RLK? So RLK, um, so first of all, we're interested in studying the Hilbert series of the subalgebras of a cohoma of the cohomology ring of the Grassmannian, complex Grassmannian and rational coefficients. This ring can be interpreted as follows as a graded ring. So we have this, uh, this ring RLK, which is supposed to be the, comp the cohomology ring of a complex Grassmannian of L planes in C L plus K dimensional space. But anyway, we can interpret this or present this as a polynomial ring. So it's basically just this polynomial ring where our variables are E1 through EL and uh, also H1 through HK. And we're quotienting out, this, out by this ideal, right? Okay, so, and it's a graded vector space because we're going to define the degree of EI and the degree of HI to be I. Okay, so this gives us this RLK definition, and we can also present this in terms of just generated by H1 through HK, where now we're going to be quotienting out by EL plus one through EL plus K. And this EIs can be presented as the Eich Jacobi Trudy determinant. So determinant of this kind of matrix. So this is, this is the main focus of study, this, this ring, this polynomial ring uh, in L plus K variables where we quotient out by this thing. And it, it's supposed to be a uh, cohomology ring. Okay. So, so first we make some uh, back, uh, some necessary definitions before introducing the reiner todozi conjecture. So, First of all, we have some background knowledge. For, no, so first we have this definition about Hilbert series. So what are Hilbert series? First we have a graded vector space over Q. And so we can write R as a direct sum of D graded pieces, R sub D. And the Hilbert series of R is just going to be this power series in Q where the coefficient of Q to the D is the dimension of the D graded piece. So that's the Hilbert series of this graded vector space. And now we define um, Q binomial coefficients. So Q binomial coefficients are Q analogs of binomial coefficients. And they're defined in terms of uh, Q analogs of positive integers and Q analogs of factorials. So the Q analog of a positive integer is this polynomial of degree n plus one, where you have one term for each degree and all the coefficients are one. So it, yes, this is the Q analog of N and uh, the Q analog of N factorial is just the product of Q analogs of uh, N, N minus one and so on. So the Q binomial uh, just, coefficient. Uh, yeah. So when you put uh, Q equals one, yeah. you seem to be getting N plus two. So it should, it, minus one. it should, yeah, it should be, N minus one, thanks for catching that. Um, 
it should uh, it should be the case that when you plug in q equals one, you get uh, exactly the regular notion uh, that we're used to. So anyway, so this is the q analog of a uh, binomial coefficient. It's this q fac uh, n factorial over k factorial times n minus k factorial. And right, so this should be a q to the n minus one. So uh, some background before I state the theorem is that the complex Grassmannian is a complex manifold. And since any manifold admits the CW structure, it has a cell decomposition. And we call these cells Schubert cells, and they're actually isomorphic to complex vector spaces of dimension equal to the size of the partition. So these, I guess these Schubert cells X sub lambda are uh, indexed by lambda. And the dimension of X sub lambda is going to be the number uh, that lambda is a partition of. So uh, from this from this decomposition of uh, uh, from this decomposition of the Grassmannian, uh, we get that the we can show that the Hilbert series of RLK. Um, yeah, the Hilbert series of RLK is just this Q binomial coefficient. Uh, so, so, so that's the, that's the point of uh, having these uh, q binomial coefficients. <laughs> these uh, q binomial coefficients they give us this the Hilbert series of this ring that we're interested in, and we're interested in Hilbert series of uh, these rings. Okay. So the reiner todozi conjecture is an extension of this theorem, and uh, so now. Um, uh, our work is centered around trying to prove uh, this reiner todozi conjecture on the Hilbert series of the subalgebra of RLK generated by the homogeneous elements of degree at most m. So we have this uh, uh, ring RLK, and if we just look at the subalgebra generated by the first m generators, H1 through Hm, we get this subalgebra RLKm. And the reiner todozi conjecture is a conjecture about the Hilbert series of this subalgebra. And so this Hilbert series expressed in terms of Q binomial coefficients and a double sum. And um, so this, this subalgebra, uh, this M, it goes from zero to the minimum of K and L. Right. Um, so some remarks is that we can check the reiner todozi conjecture in the case of M equals one, by something called the uh, by something called the hard left theorem or uh, Schubert calculus, and for the other edge case m equals the minimum of k and l, um, this conjecture. Uh, so we're just adding in all of the generators of R k l. So so this conjecture should match up with the original theorem that says the Hilbert series of the full ring is this q binomial coefficient, and that just amounts to proving a combinatorial formula where we use a notion of I vacant partitions and we can prove this. Uh, I'll get back to I vacant partitions later. Um, okay. All right, so now, um, Likewise, because the difference of the two Hilbert series of the two subalgebras, um, so if we just look at consecutive subalgebras R, L, K, M, and R, L, K, M minus one, uh, the difference in these Hilbert series is just going to be the quotient, quotient vector space. We have the following equivalent form of the reiner todozi conjecture. So this, this original one involved a double sum, and now we're getting rid of one of the sums and uh, just uh, looking at the Hilbert series of this quotient. So this is an equivalent uh, version of the reiner todozi conjecture. We now define some objects we utilize to come up with a new interpretation of the reiner todozi conjecture. So these, uh, uh, yeah, so a K bounded partition is a partition lambda where the first part lambda one is less than or equal to k. Um, and then um, to define 
a k plus one core, we need to understand what is hook length. A hook length for a cell or a box in this partition. So just look at this picture right here. The hook length of a box is the number of boxes that are in, that which are weakly to its right in the same row and weakly below it in the same column. So for example, this cell has hook length seven because there are seven boxes to its right and to its bottom. So you include the box itself. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So a, a K plus one core is a partition where no cell has hook length equal to K plus one. Okay, so this, this example is the partition four, three, one, one, and it's four bounded um, because uh, if you look at this young diagram, the parts are four in the first row, three, one, one, and it's four bounded because the first part is less than or equal to four. And furthermore, it's a six core because none of these cells have hook length equal to six, right? So this is, uh, a, it's also an eight core and a nine core because none of the cells in this partition have hook length equal to eight or nine. And um, so we introduce the maps C and P to define the analog of conjugation for K bounded partitions. Uh, we call this analog operation uh, K conjugation, which is defined as false. So first of all, before, before we get to K conjugation, we have to understand that the partitions which are K bounded and the partitions which are K plus one cores are in bijection via a map called P and a map called C. So P stands for uh, partition and uh, C stands for uh, core. So uh, the, the map P, it goes by looking at this K plus one core and then mapping it to a K bounded partition as follows. You look at all of the cells that have hook length greater than uh, K and then just get rid of those and shift everything to the right. So in this case, everything that has hook length greater than um, uh, greater than uh, k plus one. So in this case, uh, k is equal to five. So this is a five core and everything that has hook length greater than five. So everything that's shaded in here disappears and we shift uh, the remainder of this uh, partition to the right and we get this four bounded partition. And inversely, we can start with the four bounded partition and obtain a five core by just looking at the cells whose hook length is uh, greater than or equal to five. So for example, this one right here and shifting that row to the right uh, until um, it has hook length less than five. So this one had equal to five. So we shift it to the right and introduce a new cell whose hook length is going to be greater than five. So this new partition is not gonna have any hook lengths equal to five. So this is a bijection that goes from uh, K bounded partitions to K plus one cores. And uh, like I said in the, start, that in the start that this lets us define a notion of K conjugation. So uh, we define K conjugation as the composition of three maps. So using the bijection uh, of uh, going from K bounded partitions to K plus one cores and going from K plus one cores back to K bounded partitions, we can get a notion of conjugation on the set of K bounded partitions as follows. So usually when you take conjugation, you just transpose the Young diagram over the diagonal. But if you started with a K bounded partition and you do this transposing, you may end up with something that's not K bounded. So we want a notion of conjugation that's still K bounded. So it takes K bounded partitions to K bounded partitions. And we do this by utilizing the, uh, the maps, the bijections between cores and partitions, right? So first we take this uh, partition Lambda and then apply the map. Uh, so we take this K bounded partition and then apply the map C to get a K plus one core. And then we transpose that a K plus one core 
and then map back to k bounded partitions via the map p. So this is an involution and uh, we denote it by omega of k. So this is the k conjugate of uh, lambda. So here's an example. Um, so let's illustrate k conjugation using these maps with an example. First, we map lambda under c. So again, this is the same lambda that was in the previous example, 4, 3, 1, 1, 4, 3, 1, 1. And we apply the, the C map the, that takes this four bounded partition into a five core. And so that shifts the first two rows to the right and um, introduces these new cells. And then we do the usual conjugation. So that transposes this partition over the diagonal and we get this new partition. And then we apply the inverse map P, which just uh, gets rid, rid of these dark squares by shifting to the right. right. So uh, in this way, we started with the four bounded partition and ended up with the four bounded partition. And this will be called the four conjugate of the original partition lambda. Right. Okay. Um, so now uh, let's talk about k sure functions. k sure functions play a role analogous to that played by uh, sure functions in the symmetric function ring uh, q adjoin h1 through hk. Right. So first of all, Okay, yeah, yeah. So the symmetric function ring, uh, my bad. The symmetric function ring is this uh, full polynomial ring, Q adjoin H1, H true, and so on. So it has all of these uh, polynomials, uh, these H's, and we're looking at these, we want, an, uh, we know that there's a basis for this symmetric function ring in terms of sure functions. But if we just look at the subalgebra generated by H1 through HK, this forms uh, this su forms a subring, um, and we want a notion of uh, a k-sure basis uh, or a k-sure function, which will give us a basis for this polynomial ring. Right. So we already we already have a k-sure functions in this symmetric function ring, and we want uh, no, we already have sure functions in this polynomial ring, and we want k-sure functions in this uh, subring. Right, so first of all, remember that um, H lambda and E lambda are already bases. Well, I, I, would, I shouldn't say remember, but like these are actually bases of lambda K, so of these subalgebras. And H lambda is the, the element of this ring, the subring, where you're just taking the product of H I, where I is a, a part of lambda. So that's why we index them by lambdas. And if you just look at all of the partitions that are K bounded, and then look at all of the H lambdas. So all of the H lambdas, which are indexed by K bounded partitions, these form a basis for, um, yeah. So th these form a basis for the um, uh, polynomial ring, uh, lambda K. And also an E sub lambda is a basis for the polynomial ring lambda K. And so what are the k sure functions? They're supposed to be a basis of this polynomial ring sub, sub ring lambda K. And they're defined in terms of this uh, transformation uh, where we can go from the H sub lambdas to the, uh, the, sure, the sure function, the k sure functions indexed by lambdas. And, uh, this, this transformation is given by uh, something called uh, the k Koska numbers. Right, so this is a unitriangular system, meaning like it, if you write it as a matrix, um, it'll be upper triangular with uh, ones on the diagonal. So this, this unitriangular trans, uh, system transforms the H sub lambda basis into the k sure function basis. And uh, some details about this is that uh, lambda greater than, no, mu greater than lambda is the dominance partial ordering 
on partitions of a fixed size n. And um, this dominance partial ordering is given by looking at just the partial sums of uh, these partitions. So mu one plus dot 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 plus mu i is greater than lambda one plus dot 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 plus lambda i for some i and mu one plus dot 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 plus la mu j is equal to lambda one plus dot 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 plus lambda j for all j less than i. So that defines a, a partial ordering on the set of partitions of a fixed size. So this is just a finite sum. And uh, these constants k mu lambda are the cost, the cost gun numbers, right? Um, so, so organizing the cost good numbers in a matrix uh, obtains the Kotska matrix. This is the change of basis matrix from H sub lambda to S sub lambda as a basis of the symmetric polynomial ring um, lambda K. All right. Yeah, okay, so there are K Kotska numbers. Okay, so here's an example uh, when L equals three and K equals three. So here we have the, poly, uh, the ring R33, which is Q adjoint H1, H2, H3, mod E1, E2, E3. Sorry, um, just uh, before you go on, is it easy to yeah. say what the K cost ka numbers are? So, now, uh, did they count semi standard young tableau uh, of uh, shape mu with some conditions? Or? Yeah, so the K Koska numbers, um, they enumerate the K tableau. Um, and a K tableau is a weak composition of an integer n. A K tableau is a is mu a K plus one core whose boxes are filled according to the rules I and I. Okay, so I think I think it's a little bit complicated for me to explain K Koska numbers. Okay, never read. mind. So let's uh, go on. All right, so let's go on. Um, so this is about an example of what we're doing. R, uh, R33 is this polynomial ring, uh, Q adjoin H1, H2, H3, mod E4, E5, E6. So, so in, in this case, we have these, um, these Hilbert series that we can compute and uh, they turn out to be these polynomials. And uh, let's look at um, what we're trying to say in terms of, uh, no, let's look at what we're trying to say in terms of, uh... okay, so, um, so, So these are the um, partitions that lie inside a three by three box. And then when we take the K conjugation of uh, the three conjugation of these partitions, um, we get these, we get these partitions, um, which are, Okay, so uh, when we take the three conjugation of these partitions that lie in a three by three box, we get these new partitions and we look at these partitions, uh, we, we group these partitions by whether they're one bounded, two bounded or three bounded. So, uh, so we have these three different groups and then we compare these numbers that we get with the Hilbert series of the quotients. And we see that they're actually the same. Um, oh, yeah. I'm having oh. trouble reading this. Could you please? Oh, my bad. That? So, 
I need to share this part. Okay, so here is the So here is the picture that has all of the partitions in a three by three box. And then we take the three conjugation of these uh, partitions and we get these partitions and we group them up by whether they're one bounded, two bounded or three bounded. And if you count these partitions by their weight, meaning like the number of boxes in each partition and say that uh, that's the number of partitions with weight D is going to be the coefficient of some, some polynomial Q, uh, of some term Q to the D in some polynomial, then the polynomials that we get for each of these various groups matches up with the um, conjectured Hilbert series of the subalgebras. So the point is we start with all of these. So uh, all of the partitions in a K by L box, we take uh, conjugation, the K conjugations of them and then filter them by whether they're M bounded or not. And uh, those that are M bounded, their Hilbert series matches up with the predicted Hilbert series of the conjecture. All right. Um, so, So that's that's our um, that's our prediction. So we want to know: is this a general phenomena or is this just a coincidence? So so the idea of k conjugation leads us to a conjectural basis of the subalgebras that would imply the reiner todose conjecture. And to introduce these sets of bases, we first discuss an involution on the ring of symmetric polynomials. So an involution is an invertible linear transformation um, whose square is itself. So it's invertible and it takes one basis to another basis. So this involution on lambda, so first I should describe what is this involution on lambda. Lambda k is the set of polynomials generated by h1 through hk. And it also has a basis, it has a basis in terms of e lambdas and h lambdas. And this involution is just the involution that takes e lambda to h lambda. And so, um, this involution takes bases to bases. Um, and also this involution induces an involution on the graded uh, ring RLK. Well, it, it really goes from RLK to RK uh, or RKL to RLK. And so, so, so RLK is a quotient ring of lambda K and um, we see what this, yeah. so okay, it, in, it, it induces a graded isomorphism of the rings RLK with RKL. Okay. Right. So, so that's this, in, yeah. What's the, uh, I just don't get this uh, phi and C maps. Um, yeah, these are the projections. So RL, RKL is a quotient of this. Right, and then you're swapping the L and K, so. Um, yeah. Mm. So um, this is the map that sends EI to HI. Right. Or, and alternatively sends HI to EI. And if you have a basis, if you have this polynomial ring is generated by say H1 through HK, then this one is gonna be generated uh, and alternatively generated by uh, e, E1 to EL. That's, that's this, on top, right, for the lambdas. Oh, so both of them are generated by H1 through HK, but this is just a quotient ring of that one. Okay. Okay, go on. Yeah, 
So, right. So, so this, uh, so yeah. So this involution just takes um, R L K to R K L. Now, furthermore, um, the involution lambda K to lambda K on the level of this, uh, the non-quotiented ring, um, we remember it has a basis of k shear functions, uh, s k lambda, uh, s lambda k, and um, and uh, so this, uh, what does this involution do to this basis of k shear functions in, on, on this top level right here? Um, so we, we know we have this basis of k shear functions. And we know that this involution takes a basis to another basis. So what does it do to the basis of K-Shear functions? Well, actually it acts on the basis of K-Shear functions by just K conjugating the indices for these basis elements. So the K-Shear K function indexed by lambda gets sent to the K-Shear function indexed by K, the K conjugate of lambda. All right, so now, so now let's look at what happens in the quotient ring. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so, so yeah, this gives another set of uh, a basis for the ring lambda k. So now let's look at what happens in the quotient ring RLK. Here we have the basis for RLK is actually just a subset of the basis for lambda K. We're just looking at the K-Shear functions, which are indexed by uh, partitions in a K by L box. And um, yeah. And these K-Shear functions are just the image under the pr projection lambda k to rkl rlk and by the fact that um, the previous theorem which says that uh, this involution acts by k conjugation on the indices we get that um, the k conjugates of uh, lambdas in the k by l box parameterize the k sure functions, which are a basis for R k L. So now the L and the K get swapped with the K and the L. All right. Um, okay, so explanation of the theorem this is true because there is a change of basis matrix from the Schur functions to the K-Schur functions in lambda K via a unitriangular system. So the Schur functions that fit inside a K by L box also form a basis, uh, which are indexed by- can I, partition. can I ask a question, please? Yeah. Yeah. Um, could you please explain the difference between um, um, the, the indexing set in the theorem and the corollary. So k, uh, k lambda is contained in k sub l, and this is con is an element of that should also be contained in. Oh, lambda is contained in a k by l box. Oh, yeah. So this should also be contained in. This is uh, and what is so? Uh, uh, so what is W, where uh, will the values of uh, lambda to the WK be? Oh, lambda to the WK, this is going to be another K bounded partition, but it might not fit inside a K by L box. Ah, okay, 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 right, okay, thanks, thanks. Yeah, so it is by that process of uh, uh, the bijection that you define between uh, uh, K bounded and K plus one core or something like that. Yeah, you do you do that bijection, you conjugate, and then you come back. Yeah, right. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, so now, hmm. so this is this 
is a basis for RKL. And now the point is that we're trying to, right, so explanation of the corollary in involution is an invertible linear transformation, so it maps bases to bases. And now the point of this, uh, this, this basis of RKL is that we want to find bases which restrict to the subalgebra. So if we can find a basis for the subalgebra, then we can prove the reiner todosi conjecture because we just need to take the Hilbert series of that basis and see that it matches up with the conjectured formula. So what we want to do is define some sets of partitions, which we're going to index over to define uh, the conjectured bases. So these sets of partitions are PKLM, which is the set of M bounded, partition, uh, M bounded partitions whose K conjugation is in the K by L box. So, um, yeah. And also, PLK is a set of partitions whose K conjugation is in the K by L box. So uh, these have to be. Uh, K bounded in the first place. Right. So, what this corollary says is that um, the S sub lambda, uh, so the K shear functions um, parameterized by lambda, which are in this set PKL, form a basis for RLK. So, these are this is just the set of Schur functions that are parameterized by lambda whose K conjugation are in the K by L box. All right. So in our research, um, so before I talk about this new combinatorial interpretation of the reiner todose conjecture, I just wanna talk briefly about uh, an existing combinatorial interpretation of the reiner todose conjecture in terms of what are called um, M, vacant uh, M vacant partitions. So let's just go over to this section. And um, here we see an M uh, or an I vacant partition where we are just looking at the partition um, fitting inside a K by L of lambda box. So L of lambda is the number of parts in lambda. And we look at the complement of that partition inside of that box. And if the complement has a I by I minus one box where I is the largest dimension box or I is the largest dimension of this box that can fit inside the complement of this partition, then we say that this partition is I vacant. And um, Proving the case M equals minimum of L and K of the reiner todoji conjecture relied on this combinatorial interpretation of the right-hand side. So we, uh, so the original proof that of this reiner todoji conjecture with um, in the edge case M equals, uh, equals the maximum it could be relied on this um, interpretation of this conjecture, where instead, uh, it, it is basically this theorem where instead of taking lambda inside of uh, PLKM, we're taking lambda that are inside a K by L box, which are M vacant. So what we do is um, just establish a bijection between um, the lambda which are M vacant inside a K by L box and the lambda which are in this PLKM. And again, PLKM is a set of partitions whose K conjugate is in the K by L box and is M bound and originally was M bounded. So basically this bijection between PKLM and the set of partitions in the K by L box which are M vacant is just given by K conjugation. So basically what this theorem is doing is extending uh, the original interpretation with the use of K conjugation of this uh, reiner todose conjecture. All right, 
So in other words, the Q binomial expression of the reiner todosic conjecture counts the number of partitions in a K by L box whose K conjugate is unbounded. So it's interesting, if you start with uh, a partition which is M vacant and take the K conjugate, you get a partition which is M bounded. And if you start with the partition that is M bounded and take the K conjugate, you get a partition which is uh, M vacant, assuming that the one you started with was in a K by L box. All right. So finally, we get to the uh, conjectured filtered bases of, uh, of these subalgebras. So we build on this new combinatorial interpretation to conjecture two bases uh, for uh, the subalgebras, which will, and if you can prove that these are actually bases, then that would imply the reiner todosic conjecture. Because not only are these bases for the whole ring, it also restricts the bases for each subalgebra. And that's what we want to be able to get the Hilbert series of the subalgebras. So here's the conjecture. Uh, 1a says the set of H lambda, where lambda is a partition whose K conjugate is in the K by L box, is a basis for RLK. And more strongly, the set of H lambda, where lambda is M bounded and whose con K conjugation is in the K by L box, is a basis for the subalgebra RKLM. So that's what we mean by filtered bases. These, if you restrict the set of partitions to be the ones that are M bounded, just like I did in that uh, diagram that I showed earlier in the PDF, those should restrict to, um, uh, so it's, yeah, so these are, yeah, those should restrict to uh, bases of the subalgebras. And so this is a basis in terms of the homogeneous polynomials H sub lambda, but we can also, we have a conjecture for the Schur functions, the K-Schur functions. So we say that the set of S, the I, okay. First of all, we're indexing over the same set P L P K L, which is the set of partitions whose K conjugate is in the K by L box. Right. And we're looking at those partitions indexing some sure functions, some I sure functions. And we're taking the I to be the part, the first part of this partition. Um, so it's a little bit convoluted, but this is what we're doing. We're taking the I sure functions where I is the first part in the partition whose K conjugate lies in the K by L box. And uh, we're claiming that this set of basis, uh, first of all, you have to prove that it is a basis. And then we're claiming that this set of basis restricts to a basis of the subalgebras uh, just by looking at those lambdas, which are unbounded. And some res remarks about this is that um, part A of either conjecture um, will show uh, half of the reiner todosic conjecture, meaning the left-hand side, the actual Hilbert series is greater than or equal to the conjectured expression. And uh, if we can get this, this will, this will simply, uh, this will, this is sufficient to greatly simplify the proof of Hoffman's theorem, which I haven't talked about, but is an implication of the reiner todosic conjecture. And part B of either conjecture implies that the full Reiner conjecture is true because of the combinatorial interpretation that we talked about. Um, these, these things are indexed by uh, things in PKL. And if you can do that, then you have the reiner todosic conjecture because we, we, we know that these things have degree equal to the number of boxes in the partition. So immediately from this theorem, you get that it agrees with the reiner todosic conjecture. So just curious, do you know how to go between these two uh, H bases and uh, the bases in part one and part two? Is there a... Yes, uh, we do have the... 
uh, well, we do know how to go from the H lambdas to the k sure functions in the ring of symmetric polynomials, but uh, via the unitriangular system where the k numbers comprise the k or the, the, the cost k numbers comprise the cost k matrix describing the change of basis matrix. But, but here the k depends on your lambda, right? So. Sorry, it's it's not it's not the same thing, right? Because uh, the k depends. I, I'm maybe I'm a bit mixed up. So it's just yeah. the same thing. Yeah, I'm I, I'm not certain, but I think we don't have a way to go between them. So yeah, we did show that this uh, unit triangular system that is uh, that is unit triangular and lambda k does not remain unit triangular when we quotient out by the image. We ah, so, so the equivalence of these conjectures is not obvious either. Then. Yeah, I guess not. Okay. Interesting, yeah. Okay. So we did. Yeah. And that I depending on lambda, I equals lambda one is uh, yeah, a strange. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, so the reason we changed it to this instead of just taking k's because we we know that if you just take k's, it's false, right? We have counterexamples. Okay. Um, okay, in the remaining time, I'll just try to go over Hoffman's theorem, which is an implication of uh, the reiner todose conjecture. Uh, just by saying that the Hoffman theorem is basically a theorem stating that the endomorphisms of R K L have a nice form and read. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah. Um, okay. So yeah, and, and also this is this is a theorem that motivated the whole Reiner conjecture, uh, Todose conjecture, because uh, if we know the Reiner to Doge to Doge conjecture, then that simplifies Hoffman's original proof of this Hoffman theorem. Okay. And uh, the last thing that I wanna share is this Lagrangian analog of the stuff that we've done. So we were looking at the, uh, the Grassmannian of L planes and C K plus L dimensional, uh, in K plus L dimensional space. And we also have this Lagrangian Grassmannian of uh, maximum, the, so, so you, you have these, uh, okay. uh, N planes in C two N dimensional space. So, uh, so this is a, a, the Lagrangian Grassmannian and we have a conjecture for Okay, so this 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 cohomology ring can also be presented as a polynomial ring with e1 through en as generators, um, but you're quotienting out by this modified ideal, and uh, the the theorem the 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 theorem that we start with is that the Hilbert series of this full Lagrangian Grassmannian ring has this form, and um, the, the Reiner to Doze can the analog of the Reiner to Doze conjecture in this setting is that uh, we have this expression of the uh, theorem. Right. And if you can check that this is true in the case where n equals m, just by checking that these two expressions have the same, uh, mean the same thing via some combinatorial argument. Okay, thank you. That's my talk. Well, uh, let's all uh, thank Ajmain. You can just unmute your mics and clap. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Ajmain. Uh, let's see if there are any questions from uh, the audience. Uh, do you have any questions? You can simply unmute your mic and ask away. Hmm. Hello. Yes, go ahead, Victor. Yeah, uh, can you uh, go back to the 
involution omega acting on that kesur function yeah so uh, here my uh, question was that uh, do we have some plactic kind of proof like uh, your uh, left hand side is generated by k tableau and you are getting some uh, some k tableau with some k conjugate shape so do we have some operation on some that plactic monoid version you know that kind of proof so i'm not entirely sure of this but are are you asking for some kind of interpretation of what's happening with k uh, with this involution or yeah for that uh, omega of s lambda of k is goes to that so k k sur function of conjugate shape k conjugate shape so i wonder there are some if there are some operation on k tableau which uh, transfer to that conjugate shape tableau I means it's just a very naive question so yeah i think yeah, that is a that is a good question i'm not i'm not sure how to how that would work actually so. okay and uh, the other uh, doubt i had suppose you have some k plus 1 cores uh, core and you apply your map to get back that k bounded partition what is the guarantee that you will get that valid partition means what is the role of k plus core is that easily explainable yeah right yeah. so okay so i think i can explain this so k plus 1 cores do not have any any uh, hook lengths that are equal to uh, k plus 1 correct right so here this is a 5 core um and then we just get rid of all of the hook lengths that uh, are greater than uh, k plus 1 so we're just left with hook lengths um wait uh, yeah so if if you look at this first row then it has to be less than or equal to um k so this would have to be k bounded because if you had more than k cells in this first row then that would mean uh some cell in there would have hook length greater than uh k so uh okay so for example if i had like five cells remaining af in the first row after i did this uh partition map to go from cores to partitions uh k bounded partitions then that would mean the fifth cell in this first row came from something that ho had hook length greater than or equal to 5 but uh we got rid of all of those okay yeah okay i got it yeah thank you nice talk uh, any other questions Uh, if you had a slightly more complicated example giving this bijection it would be good uh, uh, so why not uh, remove the five uh, you know there is a you know the hook corresponding to the entry 6 in the second row on the right is also of length 6 and you could delete uh, those five elements so what i it's not clear what exactly you are doing to me Oh, it's, so I'm basically just sliding each of these rows um, so that all of these vacant cells are deleted. So I'm sliding them to the no. But how do you decide which from. cells to make vacant? That's the question. Oh, the the cells are the ones that have hook length greater than um, k plus one. Right. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. So you just take the cells that have hook length greater than okay. Got it. Thank you. And how do you go back? Oh, so going from k bounded partitions to k plus one cores, mm -hmm. we look at all of the um, rows where we have some hook length, which is uh... <coughs> right. So, so we look at all of the rows that has some hook length that is greater than or equal to k. Okay. And then 
we shift those rows to the right and uh, so then they hang over the, uh, yeah. So oh, here, in oh, this case, we have a five. They hang over completely. I see, I see. Yeah. It's always going to hang over completely, is it? Oh. Yeah. Interesting. OK. We have to think about that. Um, right, so it, it doesn't even have to be, right. It, you can even take a five core and then apply this core map to get a different five core. So it, yeah, all you have to do is start with a four bounded partition. It can also be a five core. And then you apply this map of shifting things and it'll, you'll get another five core. So you somehow feel that this involution is the natural thing for this class. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so how, I, I don't know much about these K-Sure functions and K-Tableau, but is there a well-developed sort of uh, uh, Plactic theory and Littlewood Richardson rule and so on for these things? Uh, So, so I think Victor Reiner, uh, or Vic Reiner, just linked the oh. volume in the text uh, in the chat about k share functions, I believe. Oh, okay. Oh yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, actually, yeah. I'm aware of that one, yeah, I'll take a look. Okay, so that's, uh, yeah, that's helpful, thanks. Um, any more questions? Well, uh, if there are no more questions, let's thank Ajmain once again. Um, thank you, Ajmain. It was very nice of you to take the time to give this talk here. And uh, wish you all the best. Um, okay, so I'll stop recording now. <laughs>